All right. Good morning, everybody. Once again. Hope everybody is having a uh, a good week so far. I like Sundays because you can either say it's been a really good week and we're just extending it, or it's the start of a new week, so you just say the old one's over and let's move on and start another a new one. Uh, I know a lot of people who had a uh, a rough week because I got a lot of phone calls, a lot of people uh, dealing with health issues and just different things this week, and so uh, let's let's move on to a new one. I, I guess is what we should say, right? We uh, we start a whole new week. Uh, that's why we celebrate on Sundays, so that we start the week with praise. We start the week uh, in the Word of God and thinking about who He is and being together. Um, I've been thinking about this a lot uh, over the last couple weeks here especially, but we really need this. We need one another. We need to be you know, together, not just this idea that you're coming to God's house or anything like that, because this is only God's house and we're in it. You know that? Like, we are His temple. We are His people. He inhabits us so that when we are here, it's when He is here. I'm here all the time, and I come in this room, and I don't feel anything. Because it's just a big empty room. But when we come together, and we praise together, and we study God's Word together, that's when He's with us. That's when this becomes the church. Um, So we need this. We need one another. We need that encouragement, especially... Uh, as the days get more and more difficult, as we deal with sicknesses, as we deal with just the struggles of life, right? Uh, it's nice to have one another. And I think oftentimes we say it's nice to have one another, and we need to get to the idea that it's crucial that we have one another. We need one another uh, to make it through this life. Uh, let's open up our Bibles to Matthew chapter 11. Finally made it through Matthew 10. And I really... <laughs> I really wanted to just hit all of 11 all at one time. Uh, and I think probably could have done it, but there's, there's, there's a really big period at the end of where we're going to be today. Uh, and I, I want to hit that point really hard. So as we, as we think about this, I want you to remember where we've been for the last month. Uh, we've been in Matthew 10. We've been thinking through exactly what it means to be a disciple. Jesus is, is not just throwing out and saying, some people are going to be this. Some people in the church are going to be this way. Sometimes you're going to get hit this way. It's just occasionally a rare thing. He's saying, this is the norm. This is what it is like to be my disciple. This is what it means. This is what it looks like. And he's saying it to all of us. He's specifically talking to his apostles as they go out. But there's a lot of things that as you read it, you start to realize he doesn't mean just them right then. He can't just mean right right then, because that's just too much, it's too big. He's talking about all of us going forward. We're we're standing right now specifically on this, it's like you're, you go over here and you stand right on the border, it'd be a really weird thing to do, but you could, you know, we could all, we could go stand there and we put one foot on Florida and one foot on Alabama, right? And we could be like, I'm in two states at one time. Right now, I'm bridging the gap between the two of them. Uh, what did they do like in the, the 90s or the 80s where they did the hands across America and everyone held hands all throughout the country, you know, all different states and all that? We can do that. And that's kind of what we're in right now is this, this moment of bridging the gap between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Between the way that things worked in the Old Testament, the way that, that everything was expected, and we're going into this new thing. And Jesus wants you to understand specifically that this isn't going to work in the old way. This isn't a continuation of the way that things were. This isn't, hey, it's been 400 years, we're just going to pick up where we left off. This is the completion of the Old Testament. This is the, uh, the, the resolving of the melody, however you want to think of that. It's, it's the answer to the riddle. It's, it's however you need to go through this. Uh, the best way that I've heard it and the way I like it a lot is if I say, dun, 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 dun. How many of you do not know what the next two things are? We've all heard that, right? Everyone knows how to complete that. And hearing it without the end, what does it make you think? Immediately you go, bum, bum. You know, you just, it's in your head. You know what it is. Jesus is the resolution of that. He's the fulfillment. He is, hey, here is what everything has been pointing to. 
And here's who I am. I'm the completion of what you've been looking for. As we start, let's read through this uh, this passage. <clears throat> you have to pardon my voice a little bit this morning. Um, but as we as we read through here, <clears throat> I want you to con- keep it in your mind about where we've just been, about what it looks like as followers of Christ, what Jesus is saying about them, and where we're going. So let's start in verse one, and we'll read through to verse eleven. It says, when Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by them. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in the king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Verse 11, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet, the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would open our hearts, open our minds, and open our eyes. Lord, so that as we study this, as we read it, as we think through what it is that you're saying about who we are, and what is going on in this specific moment in time, Lord. Lord, that you'll make us be able to understand it. Lord, so that we will see things the way that you see them. Lord, I pray that you would take this time to adjust our hearts and our minds to be more like you. Lord, help us to submit to you. Help us to follow you. Lord, help us to be your people. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. So right here at the very beginning, you have a, uh, a break from where we were, or where we've been in the last few weeks. He says, uh, and when Jesus finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. I, I like just... To start off just with that idea that Jesus didn't say, hey, here's a bunch of stuff that you need to do and here's it's going to be this way and it's going to be that way and you're going to struggle and go to all these places and then y'all go and then come back and tell me how it went. It says Jesus then, after he finished instructing his disciples on what to do, he went about and did the same thing. He continued on with the mission that he was already on. He was just bringing other people into that. Instead of saying, hey, y'all walk along with me, he said, now y'all go out and do this in other places. <clears throat> I think we have this idea oftentimes that there's certain people that are called to do certain things. And there are certain people that are called to do very specific certain things. But we are all called to be his witness. We're all called to go into this world and share the name of Jesus. We are all called to suffer for His name. That's not for secret, super, spy, ninja Christians. That's for all of us. What He's saying here, all throughout this, is that this is the normal Christian life. This isn't a special extra thing. This is just how it looks. So as He goes out, or as He sends them out, He actually goes out as well. In verses 2 and 3, you have, Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to them, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? Now, I spent a lot lot of time on this specific part. Because I have seen and heard message after message after message about John's doubt. About trusting in times of doubt and it's okay to doubt and all these kind of things. And I'll tell you, it is okay to doubt. The more that you believe in something, the more that you're probably going to struggle with times of doubt. 
You understand that to doubt something, you have to believe in it first. And belief is a difficult thing. It's something that you constantly are making the choice to do every day. That in spite of what your eyes see, and what your ears hear, and what is going on in this world, that you choose to believe that Jesus is better than all of that. So I believe that we could look at this in this example of, okay, John was in prison, and he's kind of having a moment, and he's scared, or he's shivering, or you know, whatever you need to picture in your head to, to see that. But I think it's further than that. Because as you go in the scripture and you read a little bit more, it doesn't really seem to be that. As you read further in the book, it doesn't seem like John's shaking in his boots about this. It almost seems to me more like John's saying, hey, when are we going to get the show on the road? You started this stuff, but now I want to see what it is that you're here to do. John is basically saying the same thing that his disciples are saying, the same thing that everyone that he's encountering that is waiting on the Messiah and believes that he is the Messiah is waiting on. When are we going to take over from the Romans? When is your kingdom going to be fully established here? When are we going to kick these guys out and be who we're called to be? When is the theocracy coming? When is the kingdom coming in full? That's what they want. That's what they're looking for. And it almost seems like John is almost nudging a little bit. Prodding a little bit. How much longer are you going to do this stuff when we're waiting for you to do this other thing? It's the same thing that we often do, right? <clears throat> we live this life and we're like, God, would you please just do the thing that I want you to do? Isn't that an interesting thought? Have you ever really considered what that is? God, would you please just do the thing that I want you to do? I, I've been waiting for this. I know that you said it's going to happen. Can you just do it now? Because I want to see it. I want it. There's a whole lot of eyes in those statements, right? What does Jesus say when he, when he responds? Because this is probably my favorite thing. A lot of times we, we think of Jesus as this meek and mild, and he's just kind of hovering from place to place, and uh, you know, in a cloak, or I don't know how you, you picture him. I know how I picture him. And he's just quiet and easy. I don't think he was like that. I think sometimes he didn't pull a punch. I think sometimes he wanted to say exactly what he meant without any kind of kid gloves on. He says, And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up, and the poor have the good, pre good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. He's saying, what else am I supposed to be doing? You want this thing, and I'm here doing this other thing. You want it to be military and tanks, and let's kick out the Romans. And I'm showing you that this is what my kingdom is about. It is completely different than what so often we want and expect. And I'm putting us in there because we do the same thing most of the time. We want God to fix the country. We want God to fix the world. We want God to fix all the families. And we want God to fix everything. And I believe that God's perfect will and design is for things to be like that. But we messed up. We brought in this chasm of sin that has destroyed everything. We can't have easy, good relationships because we messed up. Because sin exists. Do you know why you have trouble with your kids or your wife or your uh, husband or your aunt or uncle or your friend or whatever? It's because sin exists. It's not just because they're difficult. Isn't that usually why we think? I struggle with this person because they're difficult. Isn't that a funny thing to think? That's how I always think. Like everyone else, it's their problem. It's obviously not me. I because I'm nice and sweet and kind and easy. Uh, that's how I think in my marriage. I'm like, you know, I don't know why Natalie would ever be unhappy at all. Because I literally make everything better. Um, but oftentimes that's how we, we legitimately feel. You know, we maybe wouldn't say it. We kind of walk around with that. Everybody else has a problem and I'm just here to fix it. And we want all these things to be the way that they should be. I, I had this uh, conversation with my my. One of my best friends in the world, we've been friends since ninth grade. Uh, we've gone through a lot together. Uh, 
uh, we, we fought and made up and fought and been friends and not friends and all and traveled and done a lot of different things together. And uh, I remember one day saying to him, I just wish that we could be in the same state. Like, I just wish that we could maybe be in the same city, maybe work together, maybe just be around each other. And I started thinking, like, wouldn't it be nice? Uh, Hudson hits me with this all the time. He's like, Daddy, wouldn't it be cool if like our whole family could just live in one neighborhood and everybody else? I'm like, no, that would be terrible. <laughs> I, know, I love you guys, but ooh, that would be rough. We would probably all move away uh, pretty quickly. But I'm like, I get what his heart is saying. I know what he means because he just, he longs for that time when you're just complete with all your people and all your family and all your stuff. And there's peace and ease, right? That's what I long for. Is that moment where the struggle and the tough stuff is done away with. When that time of shalom is here. When it's not just the absence of conflict, it is the indwelling peace of God that is over all things. When we beat our guns and our knives and all that stuff into plowshares, and it's no more problems. It's all gone, and it's all over, and we're just with Him. And we're okay with each other. That's what we desire. And we're like, God, just do that now. I'm sick of waiting. I don't want to, to see this anymore. I don't want these problems and these issues. I just want it now. It's weird because just in a, like three words earlier, he's just spent an entire chapter telling you, it's going to be hard. Things are going to be difficult. You're going to struggle. You're going to be persecuted. People are going to whip you. People are not going to like you. It's going to be hard. I think what we all want to say is at that moment, like, why? Why can't we just have it all right now? Why can't we just move on from this? Jesus seems to be saying, the thing that you're looking for right now is not what I'm doing. Don't come and tell me what you want and think that I'm just going to flip the switch and do it. I think a lot of times it's hard for us to remember that we're not adding him to our team. We're going on his team. And he's team captain. He's coach. He's however you need to, to see that. The most important guy. Like, he's the one that sets the rules. He's the one that tells us where we're going. He's the one that says this is what is going to happen. Not us. I think that that may be the most difficult thing that we could ever deal with or struggle with as human beings is submission. Being the ones that are not in control. Allowing Him to be fully God of every aspect of our lives. John is saying, let's get this show on the road. Make it happen. Let's, like, can you go like, flip over Rome or something? Can we just like, make this all the way that I want it to be? And Jesus is saying, I'm doing the thing that was prophesied about who I am. I'm healing. I'm taking the, the holiness of God, the kingdom, the healing. Like all of that is coming out of me and going into this world. And he's like, I'm establishing you as my disciples to go out into the world and do the same. It's not the big, flashy, all at once, hammer on the earth, let's go. It's an infiltration mission. It's going in neighborhood by neighborhood. It's going in block by block, city by city, person by person. We're changing this world not by creating a giant organization, but by taking disciples into every place on this earth, the Middle East, Kenya, Tanzania, Iraq, Middle East, uh, Azerbaijan. I've been watching this guy in Azerbaijan uh, cook. And he just cooks like in the woods all the time. It looks crazy, delicious. And so yesterday I spent about an hour watching videos about Azerbaijan and reading about it, figuring out where it was and all that, and learning all these different things and thinking about the fact that there are people there right now that need to know who Jesus is, that need exactly what we have. All over this world there are people that need to know what you know. Don't take it for granted. Don't take this for granted. We are getting to do something that is incredible and we're called to be His, His disciples in all the world. If you're where you are, you're intentionally there. Does that make sense? 
That's a really weird way to say it, but this is the truth. Because you are where you are. I had somebody tell me, they used to always say, wherever you go, there you are. And that's it, right? And if you're there, it's on purpose. Do what you're called to do while you're there. Uh, Jesus says, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. Lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. Uh, the dead are raised. The poor have the good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by you. As you move on from there, <coughs> verse 7 says, As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. I think that this is interesting because if, if by some people are saying that John was having this existential crisis, uh, you're just like, I don't know if this is real or not. I've got to send my disciples to get some evidence or whatever. I think that Jesus wants to make it clear not only to them, but to us and to everybody that John is something special. That John isn't this person that's just shaking. If you go to the, uh, you go to the lake over here, I guess there's some of there. You see these uh, cattails, <clears throat> and they. What happens when the wind blows? How many of you have ever been in a uh, like a hurricane or like a really really bad storm? I remember when we lived in Texas. Uh, we lived in Florida for 20, 23 years, twenty four years. Never got hit by a hurricane. Uh, had all over the place. Moved to Texas. We only lived there for 14 months. They got our apartment flooded. We got hit by a hurricane. The whole town flooded. Uh, something else happened. It was like five different things all in a very short amount of time. But I remember walking outside when this hurricane is going through. And the, the pine trees that were in our apartment complex were very skinny. And they were going and touching the ground on both sides. Just swapping back and forth. And now he's like, she woke me up and made me go see what was going on outside. And I walked back in. She's like, Are you, is everything okay? I'm like, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> uh, when the wind is blowing hard like that, things shake and things move. As I was watching the chickens this morning, uh, and the wind is blowing through, they were moving and shaking. They were not very happy about what was going on. When, when Jesus is talking about John here, saying, you didn't go out into the wilderness to see somebody who was flip-flopping. Who was shaken by every breeze and wind. You're going out there to see a prophet. You're going out there to see someone who is telling you the truth. That stands to speak on behalf of God. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind. What then did you go out to see a man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in the king's houses. Just stop there for just a moment. It's a pretty... Why do you think he said that? What does it say about what John was wearing? Isn't it interesting that it lays out his wardrobe and then later on Jesus brings it up? Almost like it was intentional for us to see that and connect the two things. It says he's wearing uh, camel fur. How many of you ever touched a camel? They're really soft and cuddly, right? <laughs> I remember uh, over here at the zoo. I'm sure I'd seen one in person before that, but that's the most recent one. But I remember walking up and looking, and I was like, <laughs> I don't want to be around that. That just does not look like a comfortable look. It says he wore a leather belt, and he ate locusts and honey, and, and he lived out in the woods. <clears throat> this isn't a soft man. Who was wearing soft clothes and going into the king's residences and, and being like kind of living that life up? Those that are in religious authority above them, those religious leaders, they're in the king's houses. They're kind of in places of authority. They're getting the nice clothes. They're living a different life. Jesus is comparing these two things. He's saying, here's the ones that should get it. They should, they should see it, and they should hear it, and they should know what's going on. They're going in the king's, they've got the king's ear. They can go in and talk about things. And here's John, a rough, crazy looking guy. That's out in the middle of the woods, doing all this stuff. You didn't go out to see him because he was this soft, easygoing guy. You went out to see him because he's a prophet. You went out to see him because he's not shaking. You went out to see him because this is the one who's speaking on behalf of God about the one that is to come. 
as you go a bit further here, it says, This is the one of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. He's saying that this is the one that is going out into the world to say and to broadcast and proclaim. He, he's the one that's going to go out into the road and take the big rocks and throw them over here and take a little bit of dirt and smooth out this and take all the roots and the branches and the, all that stuff to prepare the way to smooth out the path so that as the Messiah comes, He's preparing the way. It's ready. I was thinking about it because they just came this week and uh, plowed the field over here. And how many of you like the smell when they plow a field? I, that is a, a very unique thing, and I don't. It's like when the uh, when you can tell rain's coming off in the distance. It's a very distinct thing. You just know it. But as that was happening, what what am I thinking of? Oh, they plowed the field. Cool. The first thing I thought is, what are they going to plant this time? Are they going to do corn again? Maybe cotton this time? Maybe like a whole field of tomatoes? That would be a really weird. <coughs> Uh, it could be anything. There's, there's endless possibilities. Not so much, but you know what I mean. Because they're preparing the soul. That's who John was. He went out there and he was preparing the soil so that the gospel could come out. So the Messiah could be showcased and proclaimed. That's the point of what he's trying to say. He's like, that John did not come out here wishy-washy. John came out here with a message. And the message was, Prepare the way for me. Take the word of who is coming and put it out there. The final thing here that to me is is pretty incredible. It says, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. This is this moment that we're talking about. This bridging the gap between the two. See, you had, uh, let's say Malachi was the last one in the Old Testament. And you had 400, roughly 400 years of silence. You didn't have a prophet. You didn't have anything coming from God. God did not seem to be talking to his people really in any way. And then you have John. And he's preparing the way for the Messiah. You have this prophet coming out and saying, here is what is happening now. And I like that it wasn't like the uh, you know, Isaiah or you know, Jeremiah. It wasn't, hey, here's what's coming you know, a good ways down in the future. It's just like, here's what's happening and then boom. It's all happening all at once. 400 years of silence. Here we go. He says that those that are born of women... John, nobody's greater than him. He has this position that is greater than all the other prophets. Uh, he has this position that's more because he's not only preparing the way, he's there at the same time. He's proclaiming like, that is the Messiah. This is the one. And what does Jesus say? He says, and yet the one that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than him. I think because we we're such a distracted generation. Can we can we we can agree on that, right? We are a distracted generation. And it's not even that we're distracted with really good stuff. Like I'm so busy like, you know, plowing my field so we can eat corn or eat cotton or you don't eat cotton. <laughs> Maybe people do, I don't know. Uh, but you know, we're like we're doing all this stuff because we've got to do it right now to survive. No, it's like, right, I'm on my phone playing Jewel Blast. I don't know what a game would be. Uh, or I'm checking out Facebook way too much. Or I'm thinking about all these things I need to buy and sell and do. I'm in this, this world that is distracting because we are in a distracting world. And yet, we are in a position of such privilege that prior prior to the coming of Christ, it did not exist. It, it really did not exist. You have the Holy Spirit would come upon people and leave. Now we have, what does it say? In, in John, John 15. Anybody can quote John 15, you get extra credit. 
John 15 says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, He takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, He prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. We don't simply have a knowledge about God. We don't go to a place to be around God. He is abiding within us. We are abiding in Him, and He is abiding in us. We don't go places to be around Him. We don't go to the temple. We don't go to His house. We are His people. A hundred percent of the time, all the time. That is different. You cannot find that in the Old Testament. You can go to the most like crazy people that got taken up in chariots of fire and did all kinds of wild stuff. It's not happening there. We are in a privileged position that is unheard of before this moment here. John is this, this bridging point. Because he's going from being a prophet to being like, hey, just because he's a prophet doesn't mean he doesn't have to be in the kingdom. We are in a place where we believe in Christ and he's placed us in his kingdom and it gives us a certain role that nobody else has had before that. We're not looking for a prophet or some guy that's on TV to tell you what you need to hear. You have the word of God living within you. You have the Holy Spirit living within you that gives you the ability to read and study His Word and understand it. You have the one that can give you the words to speak as you go and talk to people in this world. You have the one that can help you overcome sin in the midst of all the stuff that is going on in this world. You literally have Him with you all the time. It's not an on-off switch. It's not Samson pushing over pillars. It is... All the time. That's different. That's new. That's something that I don't think we fully grasp and realize. You are indwelled by the Spirit of God. You abide with Him. And He abides in you. The way that we bear fruit is by being in Him. Understand very quickly. It's not what you bring to the table. It's not what you take out into this world. It's what you submit and allow Him to do through you. It's a different position that you have than anyone before this moment. It's like saying John is great, but those in the kingdom have a greater role. Jesus is again setting up this comparison. Uh, This time it's between John the Baptist and us. Jesus makes this striking statement that John is the greatest, but we have an even greater position. As followers of Christ in the kingdom, we are indwelled by the Spirit at all times. We have fellowship with the Father and abide in Him as He abides in us. No one in the Old Testament had that privilege. No one. You can go through and you, like I think of Moses. And God puts him in the cleft of the rock and then he walks by and he gets to see like the, the hindered portions and what happens His face glows. What happens to Stephen? And they're getting ready to, to stone him. His face is glowing. He's shining because he's indwelled with God's very spirit. We have a special position. Do not waste it. Don't waste this life that you have. We keep talking about all these things that we need to do before we die. And guess what? It's fun. Do stuff. Have a good life. But don't waste the time that you have. It is precious and it is short. And you have, like, you have a mission. There's purpose for your life. There's a reason that you exist where you exist. Sometimes we, we, sometimes we cover too much. Sometimes we go over a lot of different things and we think through all these different things and I, one of the things I've really enjoyed, it's going to sound really bad and crazy, I don't know, 
One of the things I've really enjoyed about this coronavirus time is that we're only really meeting on Sunday mornings. Uh, we're doing Sunday school now, but, but we're meeting this one time a week where we can really talk about things and think about things. And then you have the rest of the week to think about that. You don't have another message on Wednesday night, and you don't have even one on Sunday night. You just have this one time to really think through what it is that we're talking about. To just allow that to, to marinate. And I would ask you this week to please take time to meditate on that thought. On what it means. On what it looks like in your life on a day-to-day basis of who you are, what you're doing, and where you're going. We make five-year plans and ten-year plans and six-month plans. I'm not a big planner, so I don't know how often you're supposed to make a plan. I don't have a plan. Let's just tell you that. But we make these plans and we think through where we want to be financially. We, we, we say, once I hit this, then I can do that. Once I get to this age, then I can be... If you're a teenager, you're thinking about, wait, once I hit 18, i got to do this. And once I hit 21, i got to do this. And once I get to these milestones, I do all these different things. Number one, we don't know if we got tomorrow. You don't know if you're going to make it home. And I'm not saying that as someone who's trying to guilt you into feeling a certain way so that you'll do something. I promise you, I'm saying that as someone who knows it firsthand. As many of you in this room do. You know that life is brief and it can end very, very quickly. Don't waste this time that you have. You are in a privileged position. You are in a place where you have the ability to effect a change in this entire world by being obedient, by submitting, by not going your own way and doing your own thing, but allowing Him to be the King of your life in every aspect, every day. No days off, no cheat days. It's just Him. You're in the kingdom. So, we're talking about this uh, bridging the gap between the two. This is a huge shift from one position to another. This is a huge shift from uh, doing these things and doing the sacrifice and being on the outside of the veil to literally being inside the veil, in the presence of God. Uh, Like, you're there with Him. He's within you. There's no separation in you. It necessitates a huge shift in our lives. It necessitates a huge shift in what we think about and what we do. The day-to-day is not good anymore. Just getting through the day is not enough anymore. You're called to be a priest of God that goes out into this world and showcases who He is and what He can do even with the least of who we are. Because isn't it amazing that He doesn't say... The biggest one in the kingdom is better than John. He says the least. The least. Aren't you glad that we can be the least? I was telling the teenagers this morning, I used to work on performance. Anybody ever worked on performance? Mm -hmm. So you had to work, 96% was the cut, or 96.4% or whatever was the cut. If you didn't hit 96.4% of your, uh, uh, what do you call that, production for that week, you're going to go out the door pretty quickly. And if you went 115%, you got to pay 115%. You went 130 even more. It was great. Uh, but oftentimes I feel like we live our lives as followers of Christ on that percentage-based thing. We're, we're on production. And man, if we don't hit that 100% this week, then God's disappointed with us. And He's going to, we're going to get booted off the team. It's not who we are. He is with us 100% in our failures. He is with us 100% in everything that we do, good or bad. He's not standing there with the whip. He's standing there with open arms saying, I'm with you, let's go. All He wants is our submission and our love. That's what He's after. Not what you can bring to the table, not your ability, not how awesome you are, or how cool you are, or how well you can speak, or whatever the other thing is, how much money you have. He doesn't care. He has it all. And He has the ability to do all things. He doesn't want you because you're going to bring something to the table. He wants you because He loves you and He wants you. Submit to Him and follow Him. Think about who He picked. Is it 12 apostles or a bunch of scrubs? 
Can we just be real? It's who we are. Let's just go with it. I, I wrote one last thing here. Uh, Jesus is once again calling us to the harder task. Jesus doesn't call us to this easy thing. He says, give us, give me everything. He wants all of your life. He wants every bit of it, every moment of it. He wants you completely. And what he's, what he's basically saying to us is, I want you to see the world as it actually is, not as you perceive it. Not as, not as this, this is presented to us. How many of you watch, we just have a moment of honesty right now, complete, you know, uh, how many of you watch cable news ever? Not. How many of you watch the news period? How many of you Facebook some news? How many of you YouTube some news? <laughs> Ooh, we're all getting the news all the time. You realize that it's all presented to us from a slant by whatever they want us to understand in certain ways. It's a form of propaganda. Uh, not all of it, but a large majority of it is. It's being presented to that you will do something. They want you to think a certain way so that you'll do a certain thing. It's like advertisement. You get done watching, you're like, oh, my Pepsi would really be good right now. Like, I want, they have the, the advertisement for the pizza that comes in three, it's like a drawer. Yeah, have you seen it? I want that so bad. And I can't even explain it. They don't even have it anymore. And half the time you don't even get a cool box. I want that thing because it's in a commercial. And it looks fun. What Jesus is saying is don't look at the world that is being presented to you. You can't trust your ears and your eyes and your, old, your nose. He's saying look at it in the way that I'm telling you it is. Look at yourself in the way that I'm telling you that you, that you are. Don't even trust what you think about yourself. Trust what He says about you. That is what submission is. That is what being in the kingdom is. Is that everything He says is true and everything else I see that contradicts it is a lie. That's different. Imagine living your life on a day-to-day -day basis like that. Imagine being able to turn off all the garbage that is coming in 100 miles an hour all the time at you. And just trusting that Christ is in control, that He's coming again, and that He has a plan for us. He has a purpose for us. You're not just a thing that is being moved around in the world by the governments and by circumstances. You exist with purpose. Fulfill it. Go out and do it. Tell the person next to you who Jesus is. That person that bumps into you, tell them who Jesus is. Tell them what He's done in your life. Tell them what He's able to do. We're here to represent the kingdom. Let's go about and do it.